Good morning, good morning. Thank you for returning for the third and on this occasion, the final time. This will be a much, much shorter um, presentation in which I'll just conclude uh, my work on the Domesday Book. You should know a little bit now about uh, why Domesday Book came about, how it was contrived, uh, how it looked, and uh, where those documents were kept. Uh, and, um, and today I'm going to conclude by just following the Doomsday Book over the centuries uh, until I leave you at its present home, which is in south of London. I can tell you that after 1086 it was kept uh, in the Royal Treasury at Winchester. And that's further proof that almost certainly um, Great Doomsday was written in the scriptorium at Winchester Abbey and I described in the second presentation didn't I that magnificent work of one individual who transcribed all those place names in one continuous effort. The scriptorium at Winchester Abbey is still there it's still uh, open for visitors by arrangement and that is one hell of an experience to stand in there I, I assure you. Now, having said it was held in the Royal Treasury at Winchester, what I can tell you is during the King's travels, um, the Doomsday Book uh, followed him because occasionally he might need it uh, when he went to tax his landowners uh, and in anticipation of disputes that might arise. Well, he had the evidence there uh, in front of him. So that's why it tended to follow him. But that rather came to an end in the 12th century probably during the reign of our first Plantagenet monarch, Henry II, when it moved to a permanent home with the Exchequer and the Treasury at Westminster. It was kept at Westminster until 1859. And actually from 1696, we know that it sat in the chapter house at Westminster Abbey. It's now kept, as I, I said to you, in the National Archives at Kew, and I'll finish uh, at Kew a little uh, later on. I can tell you that in the 13th century, the books were summarised and actually illustrated in a version known as the Exchequer Breviate, a much, much simpler version of the work. Now, as I think you already know, it was kept in a medieval chest which in itself also survives in those National Archives at Kew. That's a remarkable thing to see. And just like launching a nuclear missile, if you wanted access to that chest, you needed three keys in order to open it. That's obviously so that one, no one individual could get access to what was considered to be a prized possession. You've seen a photograph of the... Uh, the two Domesday books on top of that chest, at which time it was sitting in the uh, chapter house of uh, Westminster Abbey, of course. Now, remarkably, the Domesday book was not actually translated for the modern viewer until 1783, by which time it was six centuries old. That's a remarkable thing. It might give us some indication of just how difficult it was to comprehend because the man who was um, employed by Parliament uh, for the purpose was Abraham Farley. And we know that he studied those books for 40 years before he was able to publish his edition of the work. In 1954, Wear and tear required that the Domesday books were rebound, the year of my birth. And then when it was 900 years old in 1986, it was time to do something a little bit more drastic. Experts in the field were very concerned about preserving the works. The pressure uh, that came with, with the weight of the leaves was beginning to, to wear. So at that time in 1986, the Domesday books were divided into five parts and that's how they are at the moment. 
Uh, they were transferred to the National Archives at Kew, of course. And I'm pleased to say that today it's available online and you can purchase uh, the Domesday Book county by county from the National Archives at Kew. I've got two with me uh, at the moment and I'm going to go to those very, very shortly. I think the most remarkable thing for me is that until the 16th and 17th century, Domesday Book was still used to settle the odd land dispute, but almost always uh, that was uh, to support efforts by the nobility, the great landowners that uh, we're familiar with today. The ordinary uh, populace uh, had very little need to access Domesday Book, so it's fallen rather into disuse and it's now nothing more really than a, a historical document which perhaps describes where the money lay in England and that's that's the key and I want to come to that uh, before I sign off. Now I said to you that you can buy a Domesday Book county by county and I've got two counties here. One is Nottinghamshire and this is how it looks. I bought this from the National Archives at Kew at a cost of £8.50 each and every county uh, can be purchased in the same way. You'll notice that Nottinghamshire is spelt unusually as the Anglo-Saxons pronounced it. Snotingham and Snotingshire is how it was. Snote was a, a local rebel, uh, leader here, an Anglo-Saxon. But the Normans couldn't pronounce the S so they dropped it and it became from Snoting, it, it became Nottinghamshire or Nottinghamshire. Now, each county uh, is preceded by a lovely little descriptions uh, and one could go on forever here, but uh, I'll just go to one paragraph at the beginning of the entries for Nottinghamshire. Now, interestingly, you'll see that what the uh, modern translation has done is on the left hand page here, it is a direct lift from Domesday Book. So it's the original text and language used by the scribe. On this side, it is a modern translation to make it easy for us to understand. But even then, it's a bit of an intellectual exercise. However, there are one or two little gems in there. And I love uh, one of the opening paragraphs uh, for Nottinghamshire because they talk about uh, the city and the, the road north. We know it as the A1, the Great North Road. And the text from 1086 said this, in Nottingham, the River Trent and the Dyke and the road to York are so protected that if anyone hinders the passage of ships or if anyone ploughs or makes a dyke within two perches of the King's Road, he has to pay a fine of eight pound, which was one hell of a sum in those days. If I transfer to my second volume that I chose to purchase, that's a little bit of um, selfishness, perhaps, but it's my family name, the county of Wiltshire. Now, the reason I want to go uh, to this is because this has a particularly useful list of landholders in that county, i.e. Wiltshire. And it very, very quickly gives us an indication of where the money lay and who were the greedy ones. It also explains something else, I think, but I'll come to that in a moment. Because the first 20 names in a list of 68 are either men employed within the church or they are religious houses. That's the first 20 out of 68. Number one was King William, which you would expect. Number two, the Bishop of Winchester. Number three, the Bishop of Salisbury. Number four, the dreadful Bishop Odo of Bayou. Number five, the Bishop of Coutances in Normandy. And so it goes on. We get uh, Glastonbury Abbey there, Malmesbury Abbey, Winchester Abbey, Cranbourne Abbey, the Abbess of Shaftesbury. All men and women supposedly of the church. I don't think that they were serving so much the needs of the people as they professed as their own needs. 
I think this does go some way to explaining why rebellion against the church uh, developed so much uh, earlier in England than perhaps it did in the rest of Europe. I'm going to end my uh, presentation there. Uh, and in those last 10 minutes, I hope I've just sort of summed it up. On my Facebook page, you will see a photograph that I've dropped in there of the five volumes of Domesday Book as they appear today. You can visit the National Archives at Kew and in a little room there within a cabinet, you'll see displayed one of those five volumes of Domesday Book, usually opened at different pages each time I've gone in there. I've given you a, 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 a little photograph to look at to give you some idea of how they look in the display. There are wonderful, wonderful artefacts and it's nice to be alongside your own 11th century family album, particularly as no other country in the world can do that. I hope I leave you as safe and as well as I found you. I wish you all the very best. Please, please stay healthy. Have a good day.